Hi everyone, uh, maybe we'll get started now as uh, people are still coming in. Um, yeah, so uh, I'd just like to welcome you to our Focal Plane Features webinar on open microscopy. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, three fantastic um, speakers all working on uh, open microscopy and accessible um, workflows. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to go through in the order that we have on the screen. But just to start with, I just wanted to let you know a little bit about Focal Plane. So Focal Plane is a uh, microscopy community site. Um, I recommend you check out the, the website and you can follow us on these uh, social media platforms. So we have um, a place where you can share your latest research, something you're excited about in microscopy, in any of these um, different topic areas that we have. And we also have a jobs and um, events course as well, so you can uh, check those out. Um, and then I just wanted to let you know about a couple of things that we are running at the moment on Focal Plane. So uh, we're running an image competition at the moment. So you have until next Tuesday if you have some beautiful images that are just sitting on your um, your uh, data store or your hard drive and you want to share with the world, then this is your chance to do that. So we'll be featuring all of the images on Focal Plane and then there's a prize um, for the winning image, which will be selected by public vote. Um, we're also running a science communication half day workshop. So this is a free workshop that we're running with the other community sites um, at the company of colleges. So the node pre and pre lights. And so if you want to brush up on your science communication skills, both oral and written, then uh, please check this out um, and, and sign up for that. Um, and then, as I said, this is our Focal Plane Features webinar. This is part of a series. So, so far we've had uh, talks on outreach and uh, education. So both the recordings from both of those talks are already posted on Focal Plane, if you want to refer back to those. And this talk will also be um, appearing there soon. Um, and then we have some upcoming presentations, which I just need to confirm the dates on, on data management, reproducibility and citizen science. Um, and so that's uh, everything from me, which just leaves me to pass over to Richard. So Richard will be telling us about accessible, reproducible, simple and shiny, the open flexure microscope and its moving goal, goalposts. Um, so yeah, over to you, uh, Richard. Thanks very much. Um, and I'll just sort of vamp frantically for a moment as uh, PowerPoint boots up and starts screen sharing. Um, I'm hoping I, I will get a thumbs up from someone in a second. Yes, it looks uh, good. Oh, great. it's gone again. Oh. Uh, there we go. You're back. Right. OK, great. Um, so yes, I, I gave this a bit of a mouthful of a title because uh, I think every time I've given a talk for the last year, I called it something like um, Open Microscopy for Everyone, and uh, I thought it was time for a change. So um, I am aiming to talk about the Open Flexure Microscope, what it is, um, what it gets used for, and how things have evolved over the now actually quite a long time. I mean, it's about six years now that I've been working on this. Um, so for my kind of Steve Jobs introduction, this is not a toy. Uh, it's made of colorful plastic. It fits in a shoebox and it costs less than an Xbox. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a serious piece of scientific equipment. And I'm going to take a little while to talk about how it makes quantitative microscopy uh, more reproducible and more accessible. The whole project follows an open source hardware model uh, meaning anyone can make it, use it, improve it, and sell it. Um, and we've used 3D printing and Raspberry Pi to make it easy to reproduce. Um, and we've taken advantage of a lot of tools from the open source uh, software world to keep everything consistent and up to date. So why would you print a microscope? Well, for starters, it means we can make a very compl complex mechanism quite compact. So it really does fit in a shoebox or an incubator. Um, we can build things quite cheaply uh, because actually compared to one-off um, CAD manufacturing, 3D printing is a very cheap way to make a complicated mechanism. Um, and also because digital fabrication reduces that kind of activation barrier between a design and a physical object, it makes it much easier for other people to replicate the microscope exactly. Um, and doing that, then encourages people to improve it and to share their improvement 
And so it's a really nice way of, of letting the project break out of just one research lab. Um, indeed, the project is no longer just a collaboration between a few researchers. It's it's an it's its own living, breathing thing. Um, there's about 400 people on the forum now, um, and it really has taken on a life of its own. In fact, it's about all I can do to keep up with it. Um, this is a map, a very out of date map, I might add, of all the countries where we've had um, open flexure microscopes reported. Um, if you want the up to date one, uh, you'll have to go to the forum um, and openflexure.org will point you in the right direction there. Um, indeed, the speed with which this map goes out of date is one of the ways that we measure the success of the project. Um, and I think the reason it's been reproduced a lot of times um, is that we've put a lot of effort into making it easy to build. Um, that makes it more reproducible. Uh, it also makes it more accessible. Um, and having an easy build process encourages people to tinker with it, to improve it. Um, and that's how the whole project gets better. Um, the ease of build is largely what makes it such a good piece of open hardware. If it was incredibly difficult to build, if you had to come and collaborate with my lab and send a postdoc to work here for six months before you could reproduce it at home, there wouldn't be so much value in having the open license. Um, there would still be value, uh, but as it is, having that open license, having everything openly available, means that most of the people who have replicated it have had absolutely nothing to do with me, um, or indeed with anyone in the kind of core team that work on the design, uh, which is our intention, right? Um, that's, that's very much what we're aiming for. Um, and I think perhaps at this point I should correct myself and say, I absolutely think that open hardware is kind of the right way to develop a scientific instrument. Um, it's not about making it cheap. It's about making it reproducible. The fact that open flexure has also been optimized to be easy and, and pretty inexpensive um, helps get more people building it, but it's absolutely not required. And I think the, the kind of core scientific reason for pushing open hardware is more about the reproducibility aspect. Um, and realizing the potential of that, it takes a lot of people. It's not just enough to release some good instructions. Um, it took us a while to figure out the right way to organize that community um, and to support it. But having put that effort in, it's been brilliant to see a lot of people pop up on the forum who had been using the microscope for years, they just never felt that it would be appropriate for them to raise an issue on GitHub um, because they felt like that would be a complaint and they didn't want to complain. Um, and uh, so a little while after we set that forum up and realized there was a community, um, we tried to gather that community together um, and sort of draw a picture of it. So this rather fun, um, if horrifically busy slide, um, was put together a couple of summers ago when we invited a lot of people who had worked with on using the project uh, to Bath, where I was based at that point. Um, I couldn't possibly talk about everything that went on then, um, but I'll, I'll give a few of the project's cameos. Uh, so a lot of the funding for this came from Malaria Diagnostics. Um, so we've worked very closely with partners in Tanzania and also Cameroon um, who are interested in manufacturing it locally and using it as a diagnostic tool. Um, and I think there's a lot of excitement around there. Um, this won't be a primarily medical focused talk, but feel free to ask me later. Um, we had a group from Japan uh, come in remotely and present a structured illumination microscope that they built using open flexure technology. Um, and the first we heard of that was when we saw the paper come out. Um, so I think we've achieved our goal in terms of making it easy to replicate. Um, we had more medical colleagues from uh, the US who are using it in a variety of educational research contexts. Um, and as you might expect, quite a few people around the UK um, using it for everything from hands-free control in a um, biocontainment hood through to trying to use it to investigate marine microplastics. At this point, I'll put up a little um, 
a little flag for open source hardware, just in case anyone hasn't come across the concept before. If you're familiar with open source software, and these days it's pretty hard not to be, um, open source hardware is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Um, it's trying to apply those same principles to a tangible object. Um, now, there are some subtleties, particularly around the legal bits, but effectively it's trying to give you the same freedoms you have with open software. So anyone can make it, anyone's allowed to modify that design, and to share their modified version of the design, um, and they can also use it. Uh, and one of the peculiarities of hardware is that that generally means we grant permission for commercial use. Um, so that if you want to pay someone to make you a microscope, that is explicitly allowed. Um, and I can give a whole different talk on um, commercialization and why that's important. I'm briefly going to say that uh, the sort of the interesting innovation of the open flexure microscope is mostly mechanical. Um, in a conventional microscope, you need to machine things very precisely. Uh, you need bits of metal that fit over each other um, that kind of slide up and down without wobbling. And that's just that's a hard thing to make. Right. It's it's fundamentally quite expensive to do this well. Um, and so when Thor Labs charge you lots of money for the translation stages, I don't think they're ripping you off. It's just that it's quite a hard thing to do nicely. Um, if you try to 3D print that mechanism, it would be rubbish. Trust me, I've, I've done it. And it is very hard to make a good dovetail stage. Um, so the open flexure microscope instead bends. Um, each of the little thin bits in this parallelogram mechanism are like the lid on your shampoo bottle. Uh, and it turns out that because plastic is softer than metal, actually, these plastic flexure mechanisms are a really good way to make the precision translation stage that you need for a microscope. The optics of the open flexure microscope are actually pretty boring. Um, it's a basic bright field microscope, um, either using an upside down webcam lens or just a regular um, RMS threaded objective. Um, most of the time we set it up in bright field. That's typically what you do for a lot of diagnostic microscopy. But we can also do reflection mode imaging. Um, so this is looking at some graphene flakes. Um, we can stick polarizers in if you want to do uh, petrographic imaging. Uh, we can even set it up in fluorescence, although the fluorescence has never been quite as polished as I would have liked. Um, that's still a work in progress. But perhaps the most exciting optics are the ones that I didn't do. Um, and so this is a picture of the Delta stage, which is a, a version of the microscope designed specifically to be easy to swap the object, uh, swap the optics out of and put in your own custom stuff. Um, and so Brian Patton's group, um, who are now my next door neighbors, although they weren't at the time, um, used this to put in a laser and a better camera um, and do surf super resolution with nano diamond probes. Um, and so they reckoned they were getting a resolution that was down to maybe 150 nanometers, which is not bad in a system that costs less than a thousand pounds. Um, and that was including their upgraded laser and camera. I think though the, uh, the most impressive images we take these days are generally the big tile ones. Um, so if my video works, fingers crossed, um, this is a big pap smear. So this is about 500 fields of view stitched together. Um, and a big advantage of the way we've built the open flexure microscope is that it's very easy to automate. Um, it can run even if you unplug your computer from it. And so it's perfect for taking these great big scans. Um, and indeed, that's where a lot of the possible diagnostic uses of the system come from. Um, We've been exploring that diagnostic angle. Um, and so this photo was from a trip that Joe uh, in the back of the photo took in January to Rwanda, where they were using open flexure microscopes effectively as slide scanners um, to allow clinicians at a hospital uh, in Shashive to digitize slides so they can get a remote second opinion. Um, and that's something that they, they didn't have the kit to do um, until we were able to bring out some open flexure microscopes. So at this point, I'm going to briefly show an acknowledgement slide. Um, the team on here gets ever bigger. 
And I think it's important to recognize the team on here is now a very small fraction of the global community that makes OpenFlexure uh, what it is. Um, assuming I haven't timed out already, um, no, one, no one's waving frantically at me. Um, I want to put in a, a slide devoted to documentation because I think this is so important. Um, when I was doing my PhD, the expectation was I would write a paper about a thing and that would be the documentation I share with the world. And I'm very happy that science has moved on from that. Um, you know, with the open lecture microscope, yes, there are some papers, but there's also really a comprehensive set of instructions. Um, and in fact, as part of our work, we put together a software tool to help us manage those assembly instructions. And it does things like count all of the different times we mention particular screws so that um, on the front page, you get a bill of materials that's actually accurate. Um, it's amazing how easy it is to have instructions that are not self-consistent and that then makes it hard for people to get all the bits. Um, and so I'd commend Git building to you if you are trying to manage assembly instructions for something. Um, we've also got quite extensive documentation of the software. So if you want to write a script to control the microscope, um, there's a lot of helpful information on that. Um, there's a forum, which is kind of less formal, but actually still a really important source of know-how um, for all of the kind of little tips and tweaks and, oh, I'm stuck with this. How do I solve that? Um, that don't really belong in the instructions, but are nonetheless incredibly valuable. Um, and lastly, we have a website at openflexure.org that tries to pull everything together and give a friendly point of entry to the project. Uh, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be right not to show you anything of the microscope actually in use. Um, and so this is a little uh, screen capture of the microscope software. Um, I mentioned uh, Shiny in the list of things. Um, we've tried very hard to make the software easy to use because I think the OpenFlexure microscope appeals to people who want to write lots of Python code to control everything, but it also appeals to people who want to just use a nice finished user interface. Um, and we've put a lot of effort into the software architecture to make that possible. So what I'm showing off here is that I can do click to move because it, it automatically calibrates the relationship between the stage and the camera. Um, so even if it's been built slightly squint, um, you should still be able to do those kind of smart microscopy things that require you to have a calibrated stage and camera. Um, all of that is enabled by a software architecture um, that's based on the web. Um, you can plug a microscope straight into a monitor because there's a Raspberry Pi in the bottom. Um, but most of the time, I plug a network cable into it and I can control it from my laptop. And that means I can control lots of microscopes from one laptop. It means that I can have my nice friendly interface at the same time as having a Python script that controls an experiment. Um, I could talk about the software architecture all day, um, but I'll leave it at that. And if you want to hear more, ask a question. Um, and we've tried to go one better than just say, you can either have the point and click interface or you can write a Python script. Um, we've got a, a visual programming interface um, that tries to make it a bit more intuitive to automate kind of simple procedures by writing a recipe in Blockly. Um, we started doing this to take the microscope into schools, but actually the first people who used it were researchers who just didn't want to learn the Python API. Um, and so I'm very excited about where that can take us. Right, I think I have definitely spoken for long enough. So I'm gonna stop there, um, say thank you very much. And I don't know whether we're having questions at the end or questions now, but I'll be uh, very excited to answer some. Yeah, so we're, we have questions now um, for Richard. So if you have any questions, then please type them into the question and answer box. Uh, we have one already. Um, so the question is, where is the best place to find networking documentation on the forum or the Git? Thanks very much. Networking documentation as in uh, documentation for controlling it over the network. Um, actually, the, the best place to get that um, is the microscope. So the, the software that runs on the microscope um, will serve you up a web page that walks you through all of the functions. Um, 
the the software documentation that is on read the docs um, should describe how to get that. Um, so if you've got a microscope, the answer is you you point your web browser at the microscope um, and that should show it to you. Uh, if you don't have a microscope in front of you and you want to have a look at it, um, there was a copy that you could browse linked to from the documentation. Um, but uh, I'm currently in the middle of a big software rewrite. So that may currently be broken. Um, if it is, I would love to hear from you. And if you if you prod me, I promise to make it available again. Great. I, I mean, I guess people can interact uh, with you via the forum and the, the website um, as well. Yes. I had a quick question actually about the forum. So is the forum, is it kind of for everyone or is it for developers or users or how, how exactly does for, that? Forum is for everyone, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think most of the people on it are either using one or interested in using one. Um, but yeah, it's absolutely not restricted to the developers. Um, that's a, a rather smaller bunch. Okay, perfect. Okay, well, um, thanks uh, very much, Richard. I think in the interest of time, we should probably uh, move on. Um, thank you so much. It's a fantastic sounding project. Um, so uh, yeah, next we'll be hearing from um, Jan. So Jan's gonna tell us about um, Flamingo putting advanced microscopes in the hands of biologists. Um, so yeah, over to you, Jan. Yes, thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, so I'll give you uh, an introduction into Flamingo, our latest uh, light sheet microscope. So just to introduce uh, my lab briefly, uh, if we wanted to summarize it in one sentence, we're basically trying to build the best possible microscope for a given application, typically in development of biology. And uh, while this may be a bit of an exaggeration, the idea is that we have a multidisciplinary team in the lab uh, with biologists thinking of uh, new uh, experiments that they would like to do. And then hopefully the physicists in the lab can, can build the instrument that they would love to have uh, and thereby enable experiments that you could never do on a, on a commercial system. So. Um, so as you will see, uh, light sheet microscopy, which is our primary technique, is, is actually quite well suited to, like we say, like to say, uh, build the microscope around the sample. So what is light sheet microscopy? Uh, I guess most are not by now familiar with this, uh, but it's a it's a very straightforward uh, technical implementation of optical sectioning, where you illuminate the specimen from one side with a ideally thin uh, laser light sheet. And then perpendicular to that, you have a detection lens that collects the fluorescence from this plane. Uh, as you can see here in the photograph, sometimes there's multiple lenses involved, uh, in this case, uh, double-sided illumination. And you can see the laser light sheet in the middle between the lenses. And that's exactly where, the, where you would place the sample. Uh, the sample typically can also be rotated. So you can look at it from different sides. Uh, and you slowly transition it to, through the light sheet uh, to acquire three-dimensional data set. And that typically only takes a, a few seconds. So it's dramatically faster than a confocal would ever be. Uh, and it's also a very efficient way of, uh, of doing optical section and fluorescence imaging in, in larger specimens, meaning specimens that are a few hundred microns or a few millimeters in size. So since the early days of light sheet microscopy, so um, this uh, application of, uh, of light sheet to developmental biology was actually my PhD work back at EMBL together with these two fellows, Ernst and Jim. Uh, since then, things have changed, of course, and a uh, little uh, spoiler here, this is what the, what the flamingo now looks like. Uh, but throughout all those about 20 years by now, um, what's been most important for me and for my lab has always been to keep the possible phototoxicity as low as possible. So being as gentle as possible on the specimen to be able to actually acquire the true biology without, uh, or at least with uh, as little uh, artifacts as possible due to the imaging. 
And so light sheet microscopy, I think, is ideal for that because of the low phototoxicity as well as uh, because of the very fast acquisition. Uh, of course, we also enjoy uh, pretty good depth uh, penetration and good resolution, but it's not the primary goal, I would say. And as you will see, some of the movies I'll show you on the next slide are actually quite unique to light sheet microscopy, and there isn't really any other technique with which you can uh, do these kind of experiments. The other thing I would like to mention here, uh, which is always very important for me, is that the system is actually sort of instant on, meaning you can, you can turn it on and it works immediately without having to uh, realign the system every day which unfortunately is oftentimes the case for some of the, the new developments where people try to tune a microscope to, uh, to enhance its performance, but then uh, this happens at the cost of usability. And so for me and my lab, it's always been important that, that the systems are actually usable uh, also by the biologists in the lab. So uh, just to uh, show off some, some cool videos uh, that we've taken throughout the years. Uh, so I mentioned the fast uh, acquisition in light sheet allows us to, to image and reconstruct the beating heart in a zebrafish uh, or image the zebrafish development, in this case, the vascular system over time. In fact, over several days from multiple angles. And again, these are the kind of applications that you could never do uh, on a confocal because the sample would simply not survive the intense laser exposure. And also oftentimes uh, the sample preparation is just not adequate uh, for something that's a few millimeters in size and, uh, and likes to grow or, or move around. Um, this example here is zebrafish gastrulation where basically uh, eight different views uh, have been merged to uh, reconstruct this, this uh, embryo that's about a millimeter in diameter and image it over, over 20 hours, uh, 24 hours or so. Um, and then here we have uh, uh, an example from uh, neuroscience where we see these uh, uh, also uh, these, these neurons growing out. I think it's also a nice example to showcase the resolution of the system but also here the challenge is mostly in the sample preparation uh, to keep the sample happy over the course of many hours um, uh, and image it at a very rapid rate so you can follow all the details in these data. Um, of course, at some point the sample is simply too big uh, for live imaging, uh, but then also uh, tissue clearing uh, is, is, a, is a tool we can use and where light sheet microscopy is also the ideal uh, technique for imaging those samples. So basically going from very small and live all the way up to sometimes centimeter size clear tissues, light sheet microscopy is really the tool of choice. So the, the problem over the years, however, has been that uh, the systems that we have built have always been rather large and complex and uh, screwed onto large optical tables, which meant that they were neither reproducible easily or shareable, um, and even within the lab, uh, oftentimes very difficult to operate because as soon as the person who had built this instrument leaves the lab, uh, the rest of the lab may not even know how to use the system or parts of that system may get uh, removed for other setups. And then you have a, a table full of optics that is, is not usable anymore. So. In that sense, that isn't really sustainable. And, uh, and I also learned it the hard way when I moved from, uh, from Dresden to, to Madison uh, a few years ago, we had like eight or so uh, custom built light sheet microscopes in the lab and, and, and it was essentially impossible uh, to move them to my new lab uh, because yeah, simply the people in the lab would not know how to uh, assemble it again if we were to just put the parts into boxes and shipped it to the US. So the vision was to, to uh, design a reproducible microscope framework that would allow us not only to build one high-end light sheet microscope, but many. Uh, and that would of course allow uh, many people to, in the lab to use the same uh, uh, microscope architecture on different setups and also include, increase our throughput. 
So instead of having one super duper machine in the lab that only one person can use at a time, we would have many microscopes and they would all use the same hardware and the same software. Now, of course, um, it would be even better if we could actually uh, build systems in different configuration and thereby adapt them to different scientific questions, which uh, has never really been easy for us. So of course there have been several people knocking on our doors and asking if they could use any of our microscopes. But as I said, since they've typically been built around the sample, they were often specialized for a given application, whether it's imaging the beating heart or gastrulation, typically optimized for zebrafish. And so uh, we wanted a system that we can more easily adapt to, to different, uh, uh, different sample mounting techniques, different organisms, or just different experimental conditions in general. So when I <clears throat> when I arrived in Madison, the, the goal was then clearly to, uh, to stop the, the kind of microscopy development that we had done in past years, but rather invest some time, actually several years now, uh, in the development of this, what we now call the flamingo. Uh, and I'm particularly grateful for these three gentlemen here who did the optics development, the hardware, as well as the software development. And uh, now we have a very mature system that uh, we've built several of these instruments now uh, and use them all the time every day in my lab here. So um, the original vision was really to have a more modular, more sustainable microscopy development framework in my lab. Um, so it was basically sort of what's shown here in the top left box, moving off the optical table, uh, having a smaller footprint, more, more modular microscope framework. But as it turned out, this was actually even a very compact system that was portable. And uh, that made us think that there's a lot more opportunities uh, for the system in teaching, in, uh, in outreach, and in, in just in collaborations in general. And uh, at this point, I should mention that the Flamingo, the way we use it now and the way it exists, it was never meant as the most, you know, the cheapest or the most portable, uh, the most compact system ever. It was meant to be the absolute high-end system in light sheet microscopy, a system that we would use in my lab. And it just happens to be also portable and shareable and also affordable so that we can actually build several of these systems and share them with collaborators. So I guess this idea of sharing a custom-built microscope really addresses a number of issues. One is that typically uh, funding goes to a single lab that then buys, uh, you know, a million dollar uh, commercial system that is typically then only to this one lab and is not easily accessible for other people. Uh, oftentimes also commercial systems are designed for certain organisms only. And if you have something more exotic, you may not actually be able to find uh, the appropriate system. Uh, also, the cutting edge of microscopy is typically happening in, in optics lab. And so as a biologist, you may, you may read about these systems, but you, you may not actually ever have access to these unless you travel to the, um, to the research lab where the system is being developed and built. Uh, and at the same time, even if you made the instructions uh, uh, openly available, most biologists would not necessarily be able to build such a system because they may not have the, the knowledge and also not the resources. For example, a, a high-end mechanical workshop uh, or 3D printers or something may simply not be available uh, and also not laser safety, et cetera, present in such a lab. And so even though we had this initiative, which was called the Open SPIM, we learned that the, the open source microscope would actually only be built by the physicists who like to, to tinker with the hardware. But for the biologist, it was, I would say, still too complicated to build such a system. And so we really wanted to create something that we can deliver as a turnkey system uh, to the biologists we collaborate with. 
And then last but not least, of course, it's not ideal if you have to travel with your precious biological specimen uh, to a facility uh, or you know, even to something like an advanced imaging facility at Genelia, uh, you would only be given a certain very limited uh, period of time to do all your experiments. And so what we now realize uh, as what the flamingo really is, is is not just a high-end instrument that we use in the lab, but it's a vehicle that we could use for collaborations and we can pass it back and forth between collaborators and my lab. And that way, not only allow people to use such instruments, but also get all their feedback so that we are not just sitting in our basement developing cool microscopes, but actually developing something useful. And we are always uh, listening to uh, to the users and see what they actually need and can adapt the flamingo system to those needs. So as you can see here, it it, it travels uh, quite easily. Um, so the, there's two pelican cases, one box for the electronics, and then one for the for the microscope itself. Uh, so here is a few photographs of the system in action, also to give you a sense of the size. Uh, so uh, some photographs here taken in Woods Hole at the Marine Biology Lab in San Diego uh, and uh, at Harvard Medical School. So these systems have already traveled quite a bit, especially in the US and now also a little bit in Europe. So this is just to showcase the modularity of the system. So we have, a, in this case, one illumination arm and one detection arm uh, and a uh, sample stage and a chamber. These chambers are typically 3D printed and can be adapted uh, to, the, to the specimen. In total, you could have two illumination arms and up to two detection arms and thereby reproduce uh, most of the uh, typical, uh, typically common light sheet configurations. You can also take the entire system and turn it on its side and thereby also realize some upright and inverted systems if that's what's needed for your sample. So for example, instead of using the hanging geometry, which is commonly applied for multi-view imaging in light sheet, you can also turn the microscope by 90 degrees and image samples that sit in a Petri dish. So all you have to do is essentially remove the, the red parts here and add the green parts. So uh, as I said, the system is easily adaptable. So this typically involves the sample chamber and all sorts of add-ons that people then develop to, uh, to keep their sample happy. Uh, there's also a clear tissue uh, flamingo, uh, which is quite impressive. And it's something that, that becomes more and more a requirement that you can also image cleared samples at, at high resolution. So just finally, I want to mention that the system is also remotely controlled. So from my laptop, I can control all flamingos in my lab and even flamingos that are remote. And that allows us to also program such, uh, such smart microscopy workflows, uh, as well as uh, help and train people that are offsite, that we send a flamingo and uh, that need assistance in, in aligning or using the system. Um, we recently had some visitors from South America. This was an initiative uh, through CCI, uh, led by Elenka mostly, uh, where we had these, uh, these scientists over to, for, for 10 days, uh, where they were allowed to, to build their own three flamingos. And so now these three flamingos will go to South America, increasing the number of light sheet microscopes from one to four. Um, and uh, not only we're helping them, by providing these instruments, but they also got the training on how to build these and can uh, teach people now more about light sheet microscopy. So we use these systems in workshops and training and teaching here at the university. Uh, and so we've taken these also for to different conferences. So maybe uh, one day you also get a chance to, to use these. Um, there's a few numbers here if you're interested, but I see I'm already running out of time. Uh, so we can discuss some of these details in the Q&A. Just want to uh, acknowledge people in the lab. Uh, again, as I said, a wonderful multidisciplinary lab uh, and acknowledge all the funding sources that has, have helped with this project. 
Thank you so much for your attention and happy to answer any questions you may have. Great, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, as I said, please uh, type your questions into the Q&A box. We have a, a question about the, the Zebrafist vasculature, about the paper, but maybe we can um, answer that one um, in, uh, in the box. Um, I guess uh, I have a, a question about, um, so if someone is interested in using uh, the Flamingo technology, like what are the first steps um, to, to being able to do that? Yeah, so um, I should I should say that this is not a microscope that's for sale. Uh, it's also not something that uh, you know you could just uh, you know build yourself and and keep in your lab. The idea is that this is a traveling microscope in the sense that um, if you um, uh, if you would like to get access to one, you would have to you know uh, collaborate with us one way or another. Uh, you would uh, basically write to me uh, and uh, send a project proposal, so to say, uh, and then we can discuss, you know, sort of where you're coming from, what kind of imaging experience you already have, and why maybe a commercial system uh, is just not accessible or is not good enough for your purposes, and in which way we can help. Uh, and then we would custom design such a system uh, and then share it with you and then iteratively uh, optimize it for your purposes. You could keep it for as long as needed. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't say, but uh, typically, you know, sometimes people are happy with having it for a few weeks or a few months, uh, and then the system would move on to the next lab. Uh, and obviously, we we are looking for challenging projects that, uh, that require such a high-end system um, that you couldn't easily do on, a, on an existing system. Excellent. Um, are there any more questions out there? Ah, here we go. Um, it says, uh, do you guys have a training program related to building flamingo microscopes? Do you work with funding agencies directly when someone wants to learn to build or obtain one? Um, not directly. I guess we've, we've had multiple such uh, building sessions in my lab. So uh, I'd say if anybody uh, is interested in learning more about LightSheet and Flamingo specifically, uh, we could certainly arrange something and have these people come and visit us. Um, we don't have a formal program for that yet. Um, if there is a, a particular interest in a certain country, I'd say the best would probably be to uh, uh, apply for some uh, some local grant uh, to get funding uh, to finance one or the other flamingo, including maybe a person who would then travel with those instruments and teach people how to use it. And of course, this would all be happening in close collaboration with us and the person would receive the necessary training in my lab. Great. Right. Um, okay, thank you so much um, for your talk, Jan. I think we should uh, move on. So uh, now we're going to hear about some um, uh, work on making EM more accessible. So um, Dumi is going to tell us about VP Clem Kit, a low cost user friendly pipeline for high resolution volume Clem. So, yes, over to you, uh, Dumi. All right, so I will just uh, locate my presentation. Um, can you see my screen yeah. and everything? Okay, I decided to start at the back. Yeah, you're good. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Um, so I'm Dumisile Lumguana from the EMSTP at the Crick, which is the electron microscopy science technology platform that is led by Dr. Lucy Collinson. So today I'll tell you about the VP Clem kit that we are developing, which is a low cost user friendly pipeline for high resolution volume correlative light and EM. So I'll first give you a brief introduction on what volume clam is. And hopefully by the time I get to the clam kit, you can then understand why do we need to build low cost user friendly pipeline for it. So volume clam is a multimodal technique um, that combines two or more technologists 
usually a fluorescent microscope to identify the localization of the protein with the electron microscope to find the structural localization in three dimensions in cells and tissues. So currently, the workflow goes with something like this. Um, so let me just get my pointer. Uh, so you first start imaging your regions of interest with a light microscope that answers your research question. And then you go through an extensive sample preparation for EM, which include fixing your sample, dehydration, resin embedding, and then polymerization. Then once you get the polymerized block, you go back to look for the sample that you actually image with your light microscope and localize it in that block. Then cut your region of interest, section it, and then pick it up on a, um, on a ITO or whatever that you are working with. Then you image that with an electron microscope that answers your research questions, and then you overlay to do data analysis. So a lot of challenges happens during the entire workflow, but the one that I would like to highlight today is the difficulty to overlay your light microscope to the electron microscope. And this is because of the differences in axial resolution. And also during the EM preparation, you basically introducing artifacts that result in shrinking and warping your sample, which makes this overlay even more difficult, especially in 3D. So in order to improve this overlay, then what you want is to put your light microscope next to the EM so that you can have a one is to one overlay. Um, so this is done with a technique that is called in resin fluorescence because whatever that you have done on your normal preparation for EM, it basically quenches out your light microscope. So you need something specialized in order to preserve that fluorescence. So what we use for that is what we called a high pressure freezer, which fixes your sample. And then you go through what we called a freeze substitution, uh, which we then basically, um, it's a mixture of solutions that are prepared for you so that you can be able to preserve your fluorescence while adding just a little bit of contrast onto your sample. So in the end, you get something, a block like this, which if you look just at it, um, then you can see your cells and your preservation of fluorescence here for M-cherry and for GFP. And then you can zoom in there to can see individual cells. So now you can actually take that block, put it in an ultra microtome and cut it, um, then image it with a light microscope. And because you have enough contrast in there, you can also image it in an electron microscope and then you get this one is to one overlay. So an interesting thing happened. So Chris is the one that's driving the development of in resin fluorescence in the lab. So he basically took a whole cell and uh, mounted in a fluorescent mountain and then uh, break up a laser power. And he noticed that not so much happens in terms of blinking. However, when he cut um, a section from the resin block and does the, exactly the same thing, and then he had this uh, molecules where they were blinking like crazy, which means then you can do single molecule localization microscopy. So here um, of what um, is an example. So here we have a wide, an image that's taken with a wide field. We have one that's taken with a super resolution microscope. And then because you have enough contrast in there, you can image with EM and overlay it. And then if you zoom in, you can see now um, the uh, GFP and then in a single uh, molecule localization microscopy is actually more highly resolved. And then you tend to the EM and when you overlay that, now you can actually see that the fluorescence is actually inside all of the particles because now you are imaging at high resolution. 
So then we thought, okay, um, so technically then you can do this um, where then you image serial sections one by one with a super resolution microscope like single molecule localization microscope. And then you do the same thing with an electron microscope, which means now you're moving towards a high precision volume plan. So with that, we applied um, to the CZI funding, which we got. So this is the team. We have Lucy at the Creek, uh, who's the head of the Electron Microscopy Science Technology Platform. So in this project, we're collaborating with Paul French, who is at Imperial College. You might know him from his program of open frame microscopy. Then we're also collaborating with Ricardo at IGC. Ricardo is an expert in super resolution um, analysis. And then Amy Strange at the Craig, who is uh, a head of uh, software engineering and artificial intelligence. So she's designing or refining algorithms for image analysis. And then we have um, Sonia Gandhi at the lab, who is a, um, a PI, sorry, at the Crick, uh, who does a lot of work on neurodegeneration. So she's providing us uh, with benchmark samples so that we can test the kit while we're making it to make sure that it works. And then we have Ben in South Africa at Stellenbosch University who received the entire pipeline and tested to make sure that it is robust. So the aim of this VPCLAM kit is to develop a pipeline for high precision volume CLAM whilst democratizing to making it so easy that it can be used in a light microscopy facility without the need of an EM expect. So the first step of the democratization then is to remove the complex, expensive high pressure freezer. So I have done that um, together with MC at the Creek. We now have a protocol, which we're calling it Easy IRF protocol. So we are collaborating now with researchers around the world um, to test this uh, protocol to make sure that it is robust even before we publish it. So if you would like to get your hands on it, so please drop us an email. So with this new protocol, we can now preserve um, uh, fluorescence from the GFP family. So here is the mitre GFP. We can preserve lysotracha and host in uh, ultra thin sections. We can also preserve the Alexa dyes in astrocytes and cortical neurons. So as you have seen before, um, that with this new protocol now, we also can maintain the blinking of the GFP family and for the Alexas, which means with this new protocol, we can also do single molecule localization microscopy. However, we want to now move from two dimensions into three dimensions, which then that means that we need to cut serial sections and then image these one by one to build up a stack. So currently there is no light microscope in the market that can do um, single molecule localization microscopy across sections in an array tomography fashion which means we had to build our own. So we collaborated with Paul French, who has now built us a microscope that can do exactly that. It is low cost because it's based on the open frame systems and it is easier to use. So this is our first data from it. So this is uh, human cortical neurons with mito GFP that have been imaged on serial sections and then Arturo um, reconstructed these and then uh, aligned them to produce a stack. And you can see on the other side, the 3D projections from it, which is actually quite cool to do this in thin sections. So we want from there then to take those um, serial sections, post stain them to add a contrast in them and then put them on an EM. So for this, we collaborated with uh, Delmic and Thermo Fisher, 
So we are using the Phenom Pharma's Benchtop SEM. So it is a commercial microscope, but it is low cost. It is very easy to use because you can train someone within 30 minutes and they can be able to use it. And it is fitted with a field emission gun, which means it can produce the same resolution as a standing um, scanning electron microscope. So with that, we also collaborating with Yoast from the uh, software engineering team who has now um, designed an APARI interface so that we can do section selections and regions of interest for imaging. And then he has also now helped the, the Phenom Pharos so that he can put a open source software, which is called Spam Image, that will allow us to do an array tomography imaging in this benchtop SCM. So this um, is the image from our benchtop SCM. Uh, we can see a lot of ultrastructural information, which is really quite cool uh, for a benchtop SCM. And it is performing um, the same as with a standalone scanning electron microscope. So the caveat here is that we are still um, uh, limited on the membranes that we see. So we need to work on our protocol so that we can be able to, um, to uh, preserve these membranes. So, um, so from there, then we basically want to overlay the serial single molecule localization microscopy to serial EM, which means we're now moving towards three dimensions. So as I mentioned earlier, we're working with Ricardo um, at IGC. So Arturo is the person that's running the front on this, who has done the reconstructions of um, single molecule localizations and then aligned them um, in 3D and then uh, also does the overlays for us. So here is an example in 2D we have the mitre GFP, and then we have the um, uh, electron microscopy image, which we, um, sorry, which we then overlaid the two. So then we can localize the mitre GFP in the mitochondria. So now we're moving towards a 3D. So um, this is the first um, data that we got now in 3D, where we can actually localize the mitre GFP in the mitochondria. So here uh, we're working on the reconstructions for the super resolution because we are filtering a lot of the mito GFP, so the our signal. So in the next couple of months, we'll be working on refining this so that we can have accurate overlays. So um, in the next couple of months, then we will be beta testing the entire pipeline as we have been doing so that we make sure that it is working well and then we will ship it to South Africa the entire pipeline where it will be tested in a remote facility uh, by Ben Lewis at Stellenbosch University to make sure that it is robust and it only doesn't work in our hands it also works um, in their hands and then from there once Ben is satisfied with it then he will basically um, open it up so that it can be used by local researchers in South Africa, and then from there applied to broader research across the African continent. Um, so this is uh, will be then the first step in democratizing advanced technology in South Africa and across the African continent. And the great thing is that these microscope can also be standalones, which then they also open up um, um, uh, a new avenues. For example, the tomostome can be now used in light microscopy facilities where they can actually do volume super resolution, which is will be like something new. And then the benchtop SEM, <clears throat> uh, sorry, um, it can also be used now with low constructed samples and um, also heavily constructed contrasted samples. So it opens up an avenue that you don't need something expensive to do research. <laughs> I'm sorry. So with that, I want to thank the team. So they have been working very hard 
to make sure that the kit is where it is now. Sorry, I have <laughs> entered book off. <laughs> So my cough always finds me whenever I'm with people. Um, so yes, the team has been working very hard. We only got um, the funding. It's been like less than two years now. So they have done quite a lot of work on it to make sure that we are where we are now. So hopefully in the future, we can also be um, at the same place where, uh, as you've seen with the other teams, where they show that their microscopes have now been used worldwide. Uh, so thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Great. Yeah, congratulations, Dumi. It's really a, a fantastic uh, project and really exciting to see all that you um, have done. So yeah, uh, yeah as I said before, uh, questions in the Q&A box, we already have a couple. Just a quick comment that a couple of questions have been answered um, by via typing. So if you press the answer tab, you'll be able to see see that for, for the previous talks. Okay, so the first question, uh, Dumi, is uh, have you... Have you ever tried a serial 3D reconstruction with software like 3D or reconstruct to get volumetric data on the relevant structures, for example, mitochondria? Yes. Um, so um, we do that on a day-to-day -day basis because that is basically um, what we are using at the Craig. So now we're trying to apply all the open source software into um this pipeline now. So Arturo on the reconstruction side, he's using a big warp um, to overlay in 3D the single molecule localization with the with the EM. And for the reconstructions of the EM, uh, sorry, not of the EM, of the single molecule localization, he's using Picasso. So we are using open source softwares, um, nothing commercial on on this. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, I'd just like to finish by um, thanking all of the speakers again um, and thanking you for joining. Um, it was I found it really interesting to hear how much reproducibility, um, the, the word reproducibility came up um, during the talks. And obviously, this is a really important uh, aspect of all microscopy, but especially the open microscopy project. So, yeah, um, hopefully uh, we can discuss this again uh, in the future um, as well. So. Yeah, thank you so much um, to everyone. And uh, yeah, we'll be posting the recordings. So if you have any comments or questions, then you can also add those to the um, posts on Focal Plane when they come out. So yes, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.